people when they talk about their smartphones nowadays, a little bit of guilt has crept in lately. I don't know if you feel this in your interactions, mm -hmm. but people talk about their smartphone phone use to me. I, it was very familiar. I was like, what is it? Why, why does it sound familiar? And I realized they, they were talking like alcoholics and they were saying things like, oh, I can control myself. I can only have one. Um, I, I, it's, I'm in control. It's not in control of me. These to me are classic signs of addiction and classic signs that we're not in control of these kinds of things. And the reason, frankly, you know, that we can't uh, get control over these things is that we're outgunned. Um, tech companies spend billions and billions of dollars um, trying to keep our attention. And, you know, we have this idea that it's only our two eyes looking at the screen when we're working on a smartphone or we're looking at a smartphone. But in fact, tens of thousands of programmers' eyes are staring back at you. Hello, and a hearty welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're going to be discussing a, trippy a tricky topic for all of us. Love it, hate it, most of us have one. Yes, the ubiquitous smartphone. Well, the first iPhone came into the market in 2007, and it changed the world. Now there are 6 billion smartphone users and millions of people who can't remember or even conceive of a world without a handheld device. But despite the undeniable advantages attached to owning a smartphone, like navigating, linking up with long distance loved ones, taking pictures, organizing your business affairs, all of these conveniences have come at a hefty cost. Who could ever have imagined how much power this little digital box would wield in such a short space of time. And we're only now discovering some of the subtler and more insidious effects that this omnipresent gadget has made upon every sphere of our lives and how dramatically it's impacted our behavior, our beliefs and our relationships. Well, it's precisely with that thought in mind that we welcome today's guests to the forum. Matthew Jones is a freshman at the University of New Hampshire and a member of Generation Z. Paul Greenberg is a journalist and an author, best-selling author on a variety of topics. His latest book, Goodbye Phone, Hello World, is a direct result of giving up his smartphone three years ago to re reconnect to the real world. And he's gonna share with us some of his observations and the things that he learned in that process. Well, welcome to you both. First, I'm gonna start with you, Matthew. Uh, you're a freshman at UNH and a member of Generation Z, but not a very typical representative of your peer group, I'd say. So I came across your essay, Wake Me Up When September Ends, and was struck by your insightful observations about the digital prison that you said you and your contemporary, contemporaries occupy. And you talked about the anxiety inducing scroll of doom from which you say there is little escape. Would you mind sharing with us just a little excerpt from that essay um, to let us get some sense of what your feelings are on the topic? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you everyone for having me on. Uh, so I'll start with um, perhaps a uh, nice tidbit into my essay. Um, starting with the introduction of the iPhone just after the 2006 new year, smartphones spread to the masses. They were a must have item. Initially, this boom of the portable technology sector was a mere progression of the long-standing cell phone which everyone had come to know and love. Unfortunately, these exciting futuristic glory days would be short-lived. With the popularity of social media giant Facebook on the rise, interpersonal networking was now literally in the hands of millions. Evolving from a technological advancement to a schedule one addictive drug, Smartphone and social media addiction quickly tightened its stronghold, gravely crippling America's youth year after year. Wow, I found that very powerful, I have to say, uh, coming from someone so young. Um, so you did quite a lot of research in writing this particular paper. Did any of the findings surprise you and particularly the causes of depression, anxiety that you identified in your age group? Well, when I started my uh, my research venture, I had 
I had known about the everyday symptoms of, um, of anxiety that the smartphone induces from firsthand experience in my own life. Uh, but what I did not expect were the far more severe uh, and detrimental long-term effects, um, such as depression, um, lasting a long time into the adult life, as well as social media being the catalyst for uh, more severe um, self-harm activities, such as teens and um, even children as young as 10, 12, 13, sharing stories about self-harm, cutting and whatnot. And where you would think that it may be a platform to um, help children in those ways and you know, children could support each other in, in, um, in aiding uh, their, their cure to that, uh, it, it eventually becomes a sort of a, a cesspool of kids, you know, whether or not for joking or bullying, egging people on. And uh, there have been many cases where children have um, not only posted videos of them self-harming, but uh, also committing suicide, uh, you know, all from something that started as a, you know, a mere progression of a, of a telephone, uh, which is, which definitely shocked me. Uh, and not only that, but also the extent to which um, uh, the, the addiction, um, you know, you use your phone maybe 10, 15 minutes a day, you think, oh, nothing of it. But there are people that, there are children out there, especially kids where, you know, they're in their most formative years of development that are spending six to eight hours a day on applications such as TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. And while they're watching other people live these so-called, you know, picture perfect lives, they're missing all that their own lives have to offer, uh, which is really, in my opinion, the most, uh, the most depressing part about this whole um, pandemic, if you want to call it, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Well, um I assume you have a phone. I do. So how would you describe your relationship with your phone? And would you say that a lot of your fellow students perhaps prefer their phones over people? Well, for the first part of that question, I would describe my relationship with my phone up until about a year ago um, to be typical of your average teenager. Maybe not to the extent, uh, of course, of six to eight hours of use, but I had Instagram, I had Snapchat, Facebook, I had all of the different social media applications. And, you know, I was, I was posting, I had followers and this and that. And I don't want to say I cared about my fault, you know, the, I, I would really had a vested interest in it, but I definitely was a, a big part of my life. And uh, I find that, you know, you start with one thing, you just want to keep in touch with your friends and you want to follow family. And then um, just like a schedule one addictive drug, it eventually grabs a hold of you. And you find yourself at the wee hours of the night looking at, you know, random videos for hours on end. And it's not only this mental addiction, it's this physical addiction where you physically cannot put the phone down because you're, you're just glued to it. And at one point I said, enough is enough. And I erased all of my social media accounts. And for the past year without relapse, I have not used um, any social media. And I, I really only use the internet for for uh, academic purposes. And, you know, I, I use the phone as a tool if I need to look up directions or what time is a restaurant open, which is in my opinion, what the smartphone was originally designed to do. And then Facebook came along and put a wrench in that. Um, and then to answer your second, the second part of this question, I would say that uh, it really depends. Um, and then sort of jumping to the third question because it ties in. Um, it's a lot of students, I think, would prefer to interact with people, but it's like I spoke on in my essay. Um, it, it's sort of what the behavior of one influences the other. So if, if, you know, I go into a dining hall and I see, you know, I want to have a conversation with somebody and everyone's on their phone, I'm just going to be tempted to go on my phone. So it's, and it, and it snowballs and it, it makes it even worse. So at the end of the day, everybody probably prefers to talk with people in person, but and that, that's what, what's the craziest thing about this is, um, is that if everybody prefers to, but, but nobody does um, because they all look at the other people uh, and sort of this, this terrible chain reaction I've noticed. So. so it takes some guts to do what you've done actually, which is to take yourself off these sites yeah. because you, know, you risk having no friends and being isolated and not being in the group. 
And I think that 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 fear is what keeps everyone absolutely attached to it, as you yeah. say. It's like a life support system. Well, wow, that's that's amazing. You you uh, you've certainly highlighted some really uh, acute issues for your age group there. So let me switch now over quickly to Paul. So Paul, the book is a very good read. It's short, but it underlines a lot of very important pithy points, and I'm sure you targeted it deliberately at people that would say, oh, I'm not going to read a book because it, it, you can get through it in an hour. You can read the whole book. And there's a lot of advice in there um, and wisdom for people that are thinking about how can I manage, like Matthew says, make this a tool instead of an addiction. So um, you gave up your phone three years ago. Maybe you could tell us why you did and, and if you've re regretted it. Well, I don't regret it, first of all, first <laughs> things first. Um, but second of all, I mean, I can tell you a little bit. I mean, why don't I show you a few pictures um, from the actual book and give you a sense of um, where my journey kind of took me. I came up with the idea for this book. So the, the first line of the book is, um, my son was born in 2006 and the iPhone was born in 2007 and they've been competing for my attention ever since. Um, and I had this, you know, sneaking suspicion as my child was growing up and I was sneaking little moments with the phone here and there that I was sort of maybe cheating him a little bit, but it was always like, well, he's always there and my phone's here and it gives me a nice little break. It's a little bit like kind of ice cream for the parents um, when they have a chance to kind of get a break from their children. Um, but as I, my son got older um, and he uh, started to become a pre-adolescent and eventually 12 years old, um, I realized that we'd been very much in the hands of these digital behemoths for quite a few years. And that when I added up all the time, um, if the average smartphone user, as Matthew points out, is on their phone a lot, and the average American is about four hours a day. And when I added that all up, that comes out to about two waking months uh, for, for every year that you're on the planet. And then I suddenly realized, oh my God, my son is 12, two waking years of my child's life I've been on my phone. And I've missed these, these two precious years. They've just kind of gone by. Um, and so I realized that I just, he was about to hit his teenage years. He did not have a smartphone. And I realized that I could talk all I wanted about quitting the phone, about staying off the phone, et cetera, et cetera. But unless I got him, um, or unless I showed personally that how I got off the phone, that my words would be completely empty. Um, and I remember, so we went to the, I moved to the T-Mobile store to uh, switch over to from a smartphone to a flip phone. And I remember the, um, the sales lady said, um, uh, I said to her, well, what do you think? Has anyone ever done this before? And she said, uh, no, not really. And I said, well, what do you think about all this? And she says, well, how are you going to get places? And then I suddenly realized that there were so many places that I got before there was the smartphone. And that there were so many moments that I had missed because of the smartphone. And I, I, at this point, I was sort of reminded of a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, um, the great Buddhist monk who died recently, that he said, life is only available in the present moment. And it, that really just hit me like a ton of bricks that um, literally, you know, we tend to think of everything that we get from the phone as these great things that we're getting for free, but actually we're not getting them for free. We're getting them at the expense of our lives, of the moments of our lives. And I started to think and realize that these digital companies that are um, occupying our minds and spaces are kind of like moment merchants. They're literally taking our moments from us and selling them across the board. And I guess we'll discuss that a little bit later. But that's when I started to realize that we were missing out on these really essential things that, as Matthew pointed out, um, really have a lot to do with our mental health. Um, I thought um, when I decided to write this book, I started going into different avenues of research and different examples of things that we experience outside of the phone that give us joy and comfort. And um, one of the suggestions in the book is to look up the night sky. And there, that was prompted by a, a UC Irvine study found that people who experienced vastness and awe, expanded their worldview, and tended to forego strict self-interest to improve the welfare of others. Um, and research, research subjects also felt they had more time available, were less impatient, and preferred experiences over material products. That's all being able, being confronted with a sense of awe. And the sense of experience, and the sense of dwelling on those experiences, and the sense of experiencing real life. 
Um, and even, you know, just the very simple um, habit we used to have of writing people letters. Um, in the book, I mention how um, I knew my um, a, a woman I was in love with at the time was traveling in Italy, and I knew she was in Florence. And um, I was wondering, could I possibly get a letter to her in which she possibly respond? And older members of, of the audience remember the time that when you were traveling in Europe, you could write a letter to the post office in that city where you thought they were. And here I wrote to Laura di Ferma Posto in Florence, Italy, and she got the letter. And she wrote me back, dearest Paul, I was feeling so lonely. And then um, I went by the post office and I found your lovely letter. I was so thrilled. That, you know, and, and just think about the lovers and the friends that you had, think about how you used to know their handwriting and how their handwriting used to evoke these incredible emotions and this incredible personal connection. And so I think, you know, my journey away from the phone to some degree paralleled humanity's journey away from connectedness because of the pandemic. The, think about how we've stopped touching each other and, and feeling each other's presence. Um, and so to some degree, while I wrote this book, it came out, you know, a friend of mine said I should have called the book um, Goodbye World, Hello Phone, uh, since it came out just as the pandemic hit. Um, but we literally have to, at this point, you know, as the pandemic is hopefully ebbing, we have to literally reach through and break the glass and start to touch each other again and start to feel each other again um, and start to come back in touch with, um, I think, the real timbre of our minds um, and to understand that we've been totally confused about what reality is, that we've been looking at a mirror image of reality and not reality itself, and that the sooner we can kind of break that spell, um, the sooner I think we can get back to a real humanness that I think people like Matthew and his peers who are suffering so intensely emotionally um, are feeling at this point. So I'll stop the share there. Well, that was a beautiful anecdote about the um, handwritten note, because I often think back, I, I, I tend to hoard cards and notes people have sent me over the years and I revisit them. And I don't ever remember doing that with a text. I mean, I only refer to a text for information you know, if somebody sent me details or notes or something. That's and right. so it's a whole a whole part of our human experience that's just dissolving. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you know, think about the things that got popular during the rise of the phone. And one of them was food. And I maintain that the reason foodieism became so big is when you think about it, taste is the one human sense that has not been digitized yet. Let's hope it remains. So. Anyway, Andrew, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got someone here. Just so we don't, everybody doesn't think we're all completely troglodytes here, which we're not at all. Um, somebody's written a note here, Ron. The smartphone has mostly turned me into a compulsive photographer, causing me to pay more attention to streetscapes, landscapes, and sunsets. Is this a bad thing? Well, you could do that with a camera. I mean, it, it's not a bad thing to pay attention to things, if, if that's the question. Or what would you say? I mean, I think that it's, I too, um, you know, went through a phase where I was doing a lot more photography. I was doing a lot more back when I was on Instagram and so forth and sharing and so forth. And I do treasure the fact that I have all these photos that I might not have taken of places I journeyed. But I think the problem is when you start taking photographs, not because it's beautiful, not because it moves you, but because you think about, oh, how will people react when I share this, you know? And it's this lack of um, feedback of, of, of kind of like, it's this broadcasting one way, kind of look at me, look at me, look at me, that I think I, I have the biggest problem with. And I think there's other areas, um, you know, one of the my pet peeves about this era that we're in is, is the humble brag, you know, where people humbly say, oh, I've just cooked 40 baguettes. It didn't take long at all. Look at all of them. Um, when you think about it, right, if you were personally one on one with somebody, you would not brag like this. In fact, you would be thought of it to be a tremendous bore. And I think most people who share stuff like that aren't that much of a bore, or aren't that horrible. But I do think that that kind of obnoxious behavior that we exhibit online is starting to creep into real world interactions. And it's one of the reasons that I think society is becoming less and less pleasant. And in a way, to 
follow up on what Matthew was saying about how one thing leads to another and distancing and distancing. If the smartphone leads us to crappier and crappier behavior, who's going to want to hang out with us anyway? So. Right. Well, maybe that's the end game. The end game is you can be in, the, in your room and never actually socialize with anyone except on your phone ever again. Yeah. Um, so cynics would say this. OK, um, there's lots of things to cover, cover here in your book. I guess one of the most disturbing findings was a huge volume of research by learned academics detailing the many negative and damaging aspects of the, the hours a day, which um, Matthew has actually outlined people in his age group. And people seem pretty un unable to control this, particularly teenagers. Why do you think that is? Well, it's funny. I think you and I, Mary, were chatting before the, the, the session today that people, when they talk about their smartphones nowadays, a little bit of guilt has crept in lately. I don't know if you feel this in your interactions, mm -hmm. but people talk about their smartphone phone use to me, I, it was very familiar. I was like, what is it? Why, why does it sound familiar? And I realized they, they were talking like alcoholics. And they were saying things like, oh, I can control myself. I can only have one. Um, I, I, it's, I'm in control. It's not in control of me. These to me are classic signs of addiction and classic signs that we're not in control of these kinds of things. And the reason, frankly, you know, that we can't uh, get control over these things is that we're outgunned. Um, tech companies spend billions and billions of dollars um, trying to keep our attention. And you know, we have this idea that it's only our two eyes looking at the screen when we're working on a smartphone or we're looking at smartphone. But in fact, tens of thousands of programmers' eyes are staring back at you. They're watching your every move and they're adjusting the environment so that you keep on going. So that for me, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, that I switched to a flip phone is that I knew I did not have the capacity to outsmart 10,000 programmers. And so that in order for me to have some peace of mind, I had to make a clean break. It may not be the solution for everybody, but I actually think, I think that each of us owe it to ourselves to open up some digital, digital less time in our lives, whether it's framed through using the programs like Freedom and stuff that block internet access, whether it's leaving the phone at home, home, we must, must, must carve out some hours for ourselves. They're not mediated by a tech company. Okay, we're getting tons of questions in here. So um, Miguel in Barcelona says, my question is for Paul. I'm curious about what Paul's son's habits nowadays as a teenager are concerning his mobile use. And also I wanted to add to that. Do you think you going off as an example affected his view of his phone? Yeah. Well, so my son is, when I wrote the book, my son had just turned 12. He's now 15. Um, we kept him off a smartphone until he was 14. Um, and he's eventually, it's, frankly, it's impossible for him to even go to school without a smartphone at this point in terms of COVID registration and so forth. Um, I'm not happy with where he's at um, with the smartphone. I'd like him to be less engaged with it. That said, um, I think that my example is a bookmark in his mind, knowing that when he is too much on the phone, um, it's bad, right? I think there's a lot of people who kind of seamlessly slip into it and they don't realize that there's a badness to it. Um, they don't see the negativity at all. So, you know, my son will say, let's play a board game tonight. You know, he will say, let's do something together, human to human. And I'm not certain that that would happen, would have happened, um, had he been in a smartphone ever since he was 10 or 11. I will say this, you know, there's many people pro and it for, you know, there are good things, bad things about the smartphone, but I don't think any person younger than high school age should have one. I think that, you know, there are now slimmed down smartphones that only do text, phone and maps. That's enough for any child. Um, I don't think that a child is armed enough um, before he or she is in high school to be able to resist technology or to even know what it is. So um, that would be to me like a, the Cal Newport who wrote a great book called uh, Digital Minimalism. He, he, I don't know if I agree with this, but he said that someday we'll look back and we'll see warnings on um, smartphone packages like we have on cigarette can, cartons now that you know th such and such causes this and that and that. I mean, love you Cal, would love it if that happened. Um, but I, but I think, you know, at heart, he's right. 
So I've got a question. You made me think of this while you're talking. Uh, everybody is always bragging about how many steps they've done and this and that app tells them their heart rate and everything else. Wouldn't it be great if there was a built-in app that told you every day how much time you've spent on the phone? I mean, to tell you the truth, there is. Um, th there is this thing that pops up on your phone and on your computer. I think it's called screen time. tells you. Frankly, I don't think people really care. Um, that I think, But I would think that's a great device because if people really don't know... That's a good way of actually saying, God, you know, I spent three hours today on my phone. I think it might freak people out to realize that. I think they'd be temporarily freaked out. But then again, you know, the, 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 the Borg of this thing and its ability to morph to shape your brain um, quickly overwhelms that. I think more um, striking would be to have the research around um, parent-child attachment. Um, I put a little bit of, in mm. the book um, that, you know, secure attachment between parent and child begin in the first couple of years of life. And there is some evidence to suggest that mothers who, you know, mothers or fathers who are nursing or giving a bottle, if they're forever going like this to the phone, like, think about it, you know, it's, it's not, it's not even really science, right? Like, you look at the gaze is incredibly important. When I look at you, I am saying, I acknowledge you, I see you, you exist. When I look away from you repeatedly, I am saying, deep down, you're not that important. Mm. So I think, you know, that to me is... Um, yeah, I've seen really this, but it's a kind of benign neglect. Um, in fact, um, I guess that's my biggest worry about the whole thing is what it's doing to very small children. Um, yeah. Someone on the BBC last week who actually runs a media company this woman said she recently ditched her smartphone because she went to the playground and she counted 20 other parents and herself all on the phone while their children were at the playground. Yeah. And she said, that was it. I realized that I was missing out on real life and that on my deathbed, I was not going to lament about the time I didn't spend on Twitter. <laughs> we, have to face, we have to face one cruel fact. The playground is torture for an adult. I mean, no. when, I about the, when I think about the playground, I get a wave of despair that washes over me. There's a funny New Yorker cartoon from, I think it's from before the smartphone, but it's a playground and all the kids are on the swings and stuff and an ice cream truck is driving by, but it's not an ice cream truck. It just says booze. And you see all the parents running <laughs> towards the truck. And to me, actually, that's what the smartphone offered. It was, it was a way out of that excruciating uh, experience. But, you know, parenting is excruciating. And, um, you know, you, you don't get the goodies if you don't live through the excruciating to a large You've got to put the time in. That's You've all there is to it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we get, again, more questions here. Um, as I watch this, my spouse is sitting in front of a computer watching YouTube videos, playing a game on the phone and playing a game on the phone. A good part of each evening is spent this way, but he doesn't think he has a problem. Any suggestions? <laughs> Get off your phone! You're become an agony on. <laughs> you know, years ago, years ago, there was a performance art artist named Charlemagne Palestine, and he had a video where he's just on a bullhorn going, turn off your television, turn off, turn it off. <laughs> I feel like your spouse might need that. But um, again, you know, it goes back to what's expected of us. And if tech companies continue to diminish what's expected of, of us in terms of reciprocity, then it does seem completely normal. So it's it's a dwindling of, of person to person time. I mean, I don't wanna break up any marriages here. Um, and I don't think the answer right now is just to reach over and, and snatch the phone out of your spouse's hands. Um, but I do think the way to reconstruct normal human relations is to jointly come up with times in which you both agree not to be on your phones. It might just be a few minutes. It might just be a meal. Um, it might be a, a daily walk. Um, it might be a vacation. I think, you know, one thing that was has been good for us um, as a family is that we've taken digital-less vacations before, and that's really nice. Um, and I think, again, it opens up. We, we took a crazy vacation once. It was a hike and lodge with another family. And um, it was three miles in to hike in there. There was not a signal to be had. And we, I just hadn't laughed to the point of weeping like that um, in a long, long time. And think about it. Think how many times a phone 
or digital interaction has caused you to laugh to the point of weeping. It doesn't happen. That's a, that's a this thing. That's a you to me thing. Screaming, maybe. <laughs> You're leading into a very interesting point, actually. Um, somebody wrote an article, Michelle Druin, who's a professor, wrote a piece um, in The Guardian, which I advise you to read. It's a good piece. And she's actually coined this word called technoference, which is exactly what you're talking about, where everyday interruptions uh, happen to our interactions persistently, constantly throughout the day. And the smartphone, she says, competes tirelessly for our time, our attention and our affection. So here's the quote, she says, it was called the age of intimacy famine. When we interact with our phones rather than our loved ones, she says she admits she's in a relationship with her phone because it ticks all the boxes. She responds to it, she takes care of it, she carries it everywhere she goes, and she gets separation anxiety if she cannot find it. So she then goes on to cite research between couples where they examined couples over a course of two weeks to see how their moods, their feelings, and their interactions were detrimentally affected over the course of just two weeks by the phone interrupting because the attention of the person is going to the phone and it says exactly what you're saying. This is more important than you. Yep. And how can you resume the conversation back to where the point that you left it? it you can't. Yep. So the moment's lost. So I think if people start like this uh, person that, talked about her partner being on the phone and on the computer at the same time. Uh, um, I think it's just got to be made clear, even in the experiment, you can see uh, what happens uh, to two people. I, I think we just don't know what we're missing anymore. You know what I mean? Like we've, we've really human to human relationships are imperfect, right? You know, you do have an argument, a conversation, a, a pleasant joke that somebody doesn't get, and then you get frustrated but it's through, just like the playground with its oppressiveness leads to these moments of joy, working through those struggles and disagreements leads you to places in your relationship that you wouldn't normally get. Um, one of the people I quoted in, in Goodbye Phone, is, uh, writer in Rowan Jacobson, he was you know, observing his teenage son. He was convinced that the iPhone was eventually gonna extinct the human species because um, he was finding that um, Teenagers didn't like the, they didn't like the imperfection of skin, you know? And when you think about an iPhone screen, it's smooth, it's frictionless. Um, there's no, there's no problem with it. And um, I think, you know, there have been studies, right? Showing that sexual interaction has really dropped. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is because it's like, you know, you think about it, sex is kind of gross. I mean, <laughs> You know, it, I don't want to get, get all R and X rated here, but you know what I mean? It's like there's bumps and fluids and all of that, but it's, it's human. It's like animal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to get into that is to get into life. Um, whereas just skating, you know, it's literally like skating over the surf surface of life if, if that's all the human interaction that you're having. Well, I think that if you take that to its deeper levels, it's true of a lot of things we're doing online. We want everything to be perfect. We Photoshop pictures. Uh, nothing is meant to be real or hard or difficult. And I think the lazy aspect that we've all gotten into is what troubles me a great deal about the phone is that we just rely on it relentlessly for everything. Yeah. And it's pure laziness. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So and you know, it, it's been interesting. One of the really cool things that I have been finding since quitting the phone. <laughs> has been rediscovering my sense of direction. Um, you know, and you know, you as a journalist, um, a fellow journalist know that <clears throat> when you know you're going to a strange city or whatever, you gotta figure stuff out and you gotta find things. Um, I was finding as a journalist with a smartphone <clears throat> that I was getting very lazy about just exploring the city. For example, I think we were chatting um, before I would mention to you how when I was a, a teenager traveling in Europe for the first time. Um, I, I was in Luxembourg and the signs were in French and there was a sign for what I thought was a, a nightclub called Sans Unique. 
<laughs> which I thought meant one of a kind. And, I, and so I was with this other guy who said, yeah, one of a kind, where's one of a kind? We followed it all over the city. Turns out Saint Unique in French means one way. And we were just following one way signs all over Luxembourg. Now, the iPhone would have quickly solved that problem and we would have been fine and we would have found some mediocre cafe. But as a result, we saw all of Luxembourg <laughs> and it stays with me and it's a treasured memory for me. It's the same difference. It's the thing about going in a bookshop and stumbling on a book as opposed to Amazon telling you that yes. you might like these 10 books because they know you better than you know yourself. Yeah. Okay, Miguel is on again asking, according to your book, it does pay to read on paper instead of on screen due to the different effects paper produces, uh, reading on paper produces in the brain. Yep. Do you foresee that classical paper books will have a renewed opportunity to enhance the valuable deep reading you mentioned in your work? Well, what is interesting, what I'll tell Miguel and others this is that um, before the pandemic, when I would go to uh, universities to give lectures, I would ask who here likes to read on a book versus a Kindle or a, a phone? Invariably, half the people, and these are kids, said they like to read on paper. And why? Because the paper gave them a pause from all of the bombardment and distraction that was going on in the screen. Nothing can reach you through your book, through your paper book. And I think, you know, going back to what Matthew was saying, it's a way of creating a refuge for yourself. And I think, you know, those of us who who became writers, and I sense Mary, you were one of these people that just love, deeply loved books in their way that they make this sort of beautiful world around you mm -hmm. that you really enjoy through the expanses of your own mind. Um, I think that's not going away. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure. Um, one, one thing, you know, I've had two books come out in the pandemic. Um, one thing that people who maybe are not connected to the book business don't know, but there was a tremendous problem getting books actually printed because so many books were printed in China. Um, so getting them actually physically printed and on the boat uh, to this country was a, was a heck of a thing. But I think books are going to hold out for a while. Um, and, you know, what comes next? I mean, look at vinyl, you know, that's had to come back. And I think it has something to do with that same sort of focus that you get to have on and connection with the artist yeah and i think there's a physical aspect to it too yes. it's going back to the, having the conversation with someone in person where you're reading cues as opposed to on a screen yes. i mean on a screen is great if you're three thousand miles away and that's better than definitely better than nothing yeah but yeah. it's not the same as having an interaction with someone a real interaction so um, I know where people are going to say, ah, oh, they've left out all the positive stuff. So I'm going to say that, of course, in various situations, having a phone is a, lifetime, a lifeline. And some people have actually said, I've only got a, a cell phone, a smartphone for emergencies. And of course, yeah. Um, if you're disabled, I imagine it's an amazing asset to have a, a phone. Uh, right. If you're banking in the third world or farming in West Africa and you want to know what the weather forecast is, I'm sure this is transformative, having a phone. But I think uh, the, the issue is, where do we draw the line? Um, is, it re is it leading us or are we using it? Is it using us? So this brings us to a very important point. Um, we've had on Sherry Turkle last year, who you probably know, talking, she studied this in great depth. And one of the biggest problems is lack of empathy uh, in the new generation, the younger people's inability to have empathy largely due to the fact that they haven't had enough face-to-face -face interaction. So they've no, not built up a knowledge of what that's about, which is a big lack in humanity, losing that. Um, and the other th is having this artificial sense of urgency attached to this phone, which you constantly have to check as though it's a drip feed. So that, that's created this very strange, almost trigger reaction that we feel we constantly have to be looking at. And I don't know how we undo that because we've created a culture now where you're expected to respond to things. I know the French have actually got a law passed, but you can't be contacted, I think, tech, you know, by technology on weekends or whatever, uh, outside of work hours, which is a big start, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there are other cultures out there, you know, a friend of mine just got back from Argentina and just found a night and day between 
the way people dealt with people versus their phones, a lot more direct interaction. You said a lot and a lot to unpack there. I, I just want to say to begin with, I think this empathy problem stems from what we were saying earlier about people no longer being in touch with people's imperfections and vulnerabilities. How could you have empathy for somebody if you're not showing any imperfections and they're not showing any imperfections? If it's just two smooth glass plates bumping up against each other, how could you possibly have any empathy? Um, the, the, and then the, the, and then leading on to the next question about, you know, this this slow drip of necessity of having to be in touch with all of that. Well, an, an empathy-less, uh, perfect um, world is actually flat and boring. And I think it kind of causes us to keep skating forward, skating forward, skating mm. forward, looking for something, looking for the next thing because nothing is really satisfying. It's a little bit like, you know, if you, ate, mm. you know, if you ate Sour Patch Kids for every meal, you'd be like, where, where is the meal that fills my stomach? And yet, you know, you, you would probably keep eating Sour Patch Kids if there were only Sour Patch Kids. So I think um, the only real solution to all of this is to figure out a way to have moments in our lives that are um, deeper and non-digital. And I'm not, I think we're still figuring out how to do it. One last thing, which I want to say is that, of course, people um, in developing countries, of course, disabled people, of course, there's many areas where technology is a lifesaver. Um, what I uh, object to, however, is the way that tech companies feel that they are not only um, sort of uh, able to, but entitled to take your time in addition to whatever chosen task you set out to do on the phone. So, you know, say you set out, you just wanted to advertise that you, you know, have some cassava that just went on the market. Well, all these social media companies that have all your data are going to then bombard you. They've already, they know who you are. They're going to bombard you with all sorts of other aspects that you could get involved in with your phone. And before you know it, you've gotten off task to pay attention to moments that have been sold to a third party. Mm. So it's like, yes, these tools are powerful, but we have to also remember that our lives are finite and we can't just keep sacrificing that finite quality of our lives to companies that really don't, aren't very careful with, with the moments that we have left to us on earth. Mm. That's an interesting point. Um, we're going to get to that in a second um, because we're going to bring up a, uh, Shoshana um, book about the surveillance capitalism. Um, okay, Hilda Burke, for those that are interested, is a psychotherapist, and she's actually written a book called The Phone Addiction Workbook. Um, and in it, she suggests, as, as uh, Paul just did, that you can use Freedom, which is an app, <laughs> strangely enough, uh, which temporarily blocks apps and websites on your phone and then there's another one called off the grid which enables you to block your phone for certain time periods so if you're trying to control your usage and you can't do it yourself that might be the answer for you to temporarily say i'm having a two-hour digital release from this time to this time yeah. um and i should i should i just want to point out just full disclosure here since quitting the phone you know my computer has become a bigger part of my life and I'm not thrilled about that. Um, mm. So it, these digital channels find you no matter where <laughs> you go. Um, that to me is why I continue to use a flip phone because I know when I walk out the door, I'm cut off. Mm. Interesting. So I, think, I think we all need some avenue by which whether it's digitally closing the door and cutting yourself off or physically, we all need to figure out a way to do that in our lives. Okay, we've got another anonymous question here, and it just says YouTube videos can expand the sense of empathy by putting people in touch with individuals and communities that would never run into person to person. Well, that's true, but you can do that all through independent television and all sorts of ways. And, and that doesn't require a phone anyway. You, you can do that. Um, and I do think they're marvelous in independent movies and documentaries. Um, correct? So it. <laughs> I, I think mean you've got to live under a stone. <laughs> no, you don't have to live under a stone. Um, yeah. I think, you know, there's always been a trade-off between um, being able to watch something or listen to something 
versus the actual experience of seeing that person, seeing that person's world. What I object to in the present mode of the way social media works is that it turns every person into a channel rather than a human being. Um, so I think it's perfectly fine if you want to watch a video, a documentary exploring somebody's life. But when it comes down to sort of just scrolling past one person after another, I do think it's dehumanizing. And yes, great that these videos and so forth can open doors to other places, but let that just be sort of a foot in the door. You know, let's, that's not the be all and end all. I think a lot about, a number of people have said to me, well, you know, it's very important to me. I, 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 really, I really work a lot on politics, you know, and uh, the phone is important to me. I really work on politics. Most people who are working on politics on their phone are just scrolling past one story after another. Politics, working on politics is getting on the street. It's talking to people. It's changing people's minds. It's bringing the real world problems into voters' lives. That is politics. Just passively, you know, liking, not liking, posting. It's not really politics. In my yeah, it's definitely again. It requires the work. You've got to go to the town hall. You've got to meet the politician. You've got to, you've got to engage. Yeah. Um, it's not just as you say. Uh, and somebody has just asked this. Um, as a young person in the formative years of my career, how do I balance wanting to leverage technology for professional success and avoiding it for mental health and well-being? <laughs> Ooh, that's the million-dollar question. That's the question, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think everyone finds their pathway. Um, I think um, the, 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 the one thing I think to keep in mind is that just because you've turned part of your day away from digital devices and so forth, that doesn't, it's not really a one for one loss. In, in other words, that, le that time taken away from digital devices doesn't actually necessarily automatically impinge upon your digital your your career um for example you know i'm a freelance writer like i mm -hmm. depend on connectivity and the ability for people to find me and talk to me um interestingly enough since i quit the phone my income went up and it's not because um you know whatever i was taking out billboard ads on sunset boulevard i think it's because actually that instead of writing hasty replies to queries that um, I actually took a day or two sometimes to answer emails or whatever um, in thoughtful ways. And people are like, whoa, there's some thought in all of this. So remember that as people get more distracted and fractated and um, flat, um, people with depth are gonna stand out. And I think you can find a pathway um, to professional satisfaction and to satisfying others if you really truly touch that part of you that is inside and genuine. Nice advice there. Um, Matthew, do you want to come back into the question here since we're talking about people launching their careers and such? Somebody's actually got a question in for you. Matthew, do you feel that you've been left out from real world events due to a lack of communication on social media? Um, well, that's an interesting question. People, including my, my mother, ask me that all the time. Um, I would say that quite the opposite. Um, I mean, I'm not a total uh, caveman. I still have a cell phone and I use it. Um, but when I use it uh, in a social manner, that is strictly to orchestrate some sort of in-person um, activity. Whereas, you know, people always say that. And um, just like uh, Paul spoke on earlier, it, 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 when people talk about this, they sort of sound like, um, you know, for lack of better words, an alcoholic where they say, oh, well, uh, you know, I, I, you know, they try to tell you about all the benefits it has, whereas um, this excuse that it, you're going to miss out on things, you know, scrolling through thousands upon thousands of celebrity posts is not helping your social life. Um, so I think there's a fine line between using social media to orchestrate um, an actual real personal social life or just to look at other people's photos, which is not, uh, you know, you're not missing out on anything if you don't do that. Um, so. And, and I would echo that, you know, I, I like what Matthew's saying here. Um, I think like, for example, a text message, texts are not really good ways 
to connote emotion and the way you feel about somebody. Texts are a good way for logistics, right? Um, and I think it's like, boom, 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 make the plan, see the person in person. Um, one of the tricks or one of the hints in my book is to say no to maybe, right? Like think about how much the cell phone or the smartphone strings you along. People refuse to make plans because they're waiting for something better to come along. But if you say to yourself, no, I'm not gonna say maybe, I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say no. We're gonna make a plan, I'm gonna put the phone down. That to me is a much more respectful way of dealing with people and a much more human way of dealing people with, pe with people you know, in, in real time. Um, I think one of the things I also wonder what you think about this, Matthew, is texting has enabled people to lie much more efficiently than ever. And the propensity of people to make up stories, should we say, to put it nicely, um, about where they are and what they're doing um, has, I mean, it's, it's not enhanced communication. It's complicated conspiracy um, because people are not direct. And it's, people now use it as the number one way to cancel uh, going to work is to text because you used to have to pick up the phone and say, I've got a cold <laughs> and you'd have to mimic all these symptoms of flu or whatever. And it's much easier to do the old text. So do you think people's behaviors, their actual moral behavior has been influenced at all through using the phone? Oh, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, things, the words like bravery and willpower come to mind. Uh, you'd be amazed how, how many uh, of my peers I have witnessed uh, will not pick up the phone and make a phone call to somebody that, other than their parents, you know, um, you know, in, in my life and all sorts of different things. I'm always talking to people on the phone. I, before I came to school, I was a cold caller for a year straight. I made thousands and thousands of calls. And let me tell you, nothing is more formative for your personality than cold calling um, because I can handle any rejection. Um, and so my, you know, the silver lining here is that, it's 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 uh it's detrimental to people's you know willpower to stand up to somebody and not only just with a, an everyday conversation but with um this this inability to face problems uh, in real life is a serious issue that stems um you know it's much worse than just calling out of work people are unable to talk about serious issues whether it be a girlfriend and a boyfriend a, a daughter and a mom whatever any situation uh, the smartphone has led to people not being able to face those problems and, and really take, take responsibility for what's wrong and work on things in person. And like Paul said, uh, I'm not sure who said, maybe it was you, Mary, that it's really easy for things to get twisted over, over text. You, know, you can be having a conversation and mean one thing and somebody can take it entirely different. And, and that's, that's an issue in it, in it. I don't see in any way how that helps people. Um, so like Paul said, just using it as a logistics purpose. You know, well, let's meet up here at this time that's all right. And that, you know, I do that all the time, but anything much more than that is, uh, is, is not very desirable in my opinion. I think, you know, Sherry Turkle said, um, you know, people in Silicon Valley said, we, what we really need is an empathy app. What Sherry Turkle said, we are the empathy app, you know, <laughs> humans with their eyes and their ears and their noses and their tongues. It's just, we're such a wealth of, of, crazy amounts of information is conveyed person to person, even voice to voice, that, you know, a, simple, a line of text chains is just, it's like a fingernail on, on the body of communication. So somebody's written in, uh, my friends are afraid, are afraid to call in a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, what things have come to I don't know. <laughs> I think Matthew's hit upon a great plan here. Everybody in college has to do a, at least one term of cold calling as the antidote to the smartphone. I think that's a magnificent answer. It's funny you mentioned the pizza. I actually have witnessed a, <laughs> one of my peers refuse to pick up the phone and order a pizza. That's not an exaggeration. Uh, so many choices, so many, so many vegetables, so many meats <laughs> to go in the pizza. It's hard. <laughs> Okay, so the most sinister aspect, we have to confront this before we get off, and uh, the time is ticking away here. Um, Shoshana Zupov, uh, Zupov wrote a book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism in the last two years, and it was quite amazing. Uh, I had never seen such a great breakdown 
of why people should examine, examine their use of technology and how it's being used for our uh, habits being sold uh, and traded as future behavior. Um, there's an enormous amount of money being made off what we put our time and attention to. And yeah. Paul, you, you allude to that a little bit in your book. Yeah. So yeah. is this something that people really need to be concerned about? Because this is at the nub of the whole thing. This is big business. Absolutely. I mean, what we're doing through social media is we're, we think that we're just posting and sharing stuff with our friends, but we're, what we're doing is we're offering up um, voluntarily very intimate marketing detail about us so that we can be targeted and packaged in a very, very specific kind of way. Um, on the one hand, you could say, oh, great, I only get the advertisements that I want. But if you look at it from the other side of the lens, um, as we're starting to see the rise of autocratic regimes appear, um, and we see places like Hungary um, and Russia and China where the membrane between government and business is getting thinner and thinner, it's really no small step for those kind of governments to gain access to the pro proclivities, the obsessions, the behaviors, the day-to-day -day behaviors and thoughts of its citizens. So when you think about that, I don't know if Shoshana exactly went down that road altogether, but I think in a way she wrote the book before mm -hmm. the rise of this sort of, you know, autocracy 3.0. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's the next really scary connection is that suddenly we can have a state monitoring system that is interlinked with big capital um, that can control our minds and control our thoughts and to really get us into a situation where we can incriminate ourselves before we actually even do anything. Yeah, um, this is already happening in China. Um, there was a very good front line on it, if anyone, I can't remember the title of it, it's worth watching, about they will send you, um, um, text the government and say, your, your friend is not in the best group and you've just spent 15 minutes with them. They're actually screening who you're interacting with. Okay. And uh, I spoke to a businessman that was in Beijing and his friend, his colleague, his Chinese colleague had just gotten a notification of a debit from his bank account because he had jaywalked and the yeah. government had already deducted the funds from his bank account. That's right. And was it, on his phone. That's right. And where did they get the facial, you know, where did they get the facial recognition in the first place? Well, it's people mm. looking at social media. There was this um, insidious app that went around or a little meme that went around where put your face in the camera and we'll show you what great painting you look like. And they'll, they'll, they'll go through the digital archives and pull out a painting. And everyone's like, oh, you should do that. You should do that. And I was like, I don't have to do that because this is one more way for my face to get grabbed. It's like, it's using the idea and link linking of me with great art to lure me to give my face away. Well, I'm not very um, upbeat. <laughs> uh, no. So all I can say, uh, Matthew, I applaud you. You're a courageous young man. And that fact that you've made all these deductions already for yourself speaks highly um, of where you're going. And maybe you should write a book about this um, from your perspective. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, Paul? Um, I, please do. I think Gen Z is in a way ripe for a digital revolt and I will welcome it with open arms. Mm. Well, my because sense is thanks, Mary. I, uh, I thank you everyone, Paul. You're Fascinating. It's fascinating to speak to somebody who's as interested and invested in this topic as I am. So, well, um, I hope this has been helpful to people today that um, there are ways of controlling your relationship with your phone, if indeed you wish to do so. Um, reading these books is helpful. Finding alternative ways to spend your time and just tracking your own activity and seeing where your attention's going and how much of your interactions with people is being interrupted by this. Um, Sherry Turkle in one of her books said that the very presence of a phone being on a table during a lunch shortens the conversation and changes the things people will talk about. The very presence of the phone on the table. So we've only scratched the tip of the iceberg, I think. So have a look at uh, the book. It's a great read great present it only takes an hour to read and you'll find that i've bent over the corners and underlined and then all the corners have been bent over. so a lot of helpful hints there um okay well it's almost time to wrap i want to thank both matthew and paul for your wonderful uh, input today into this topic 
Um, I think uh, you're right. We are in a very uh, kind of prestigious, uh, well, not prestigious. Um, uh, ominous? Ominous, ominous, that's the word, time for this, where either we call the shots or the technology, as you say, is, is going to start calling the shots and we're going to be the, the, the people people that are just serving the Facebook masters, if it hasn't already happened. So um, Cambridge Forum is made possible by Dorothy and Herbert Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, the Cambridge Community Foundation, and all of you. So if you'd like to donate or just sign up to get information, go to the website, www.cambridgeforum.org. There you'll find this particular forum shortly and podcasts and many other forums and also links to videos that we've shot and a large collection of newly digitized classic recordings. We also produce an NPR broadcast from this program and GBH Forum Network will upload the video shortly to YouTube. So mark your calendars. Uh, the next forum is gonna be on Tuesday, February 22nd, and it's going to be tick, tick, tick. Yes, we're going to be investigating the other silent but insidious epidemic that we are not getting enough, paying enough attention to, and that's Lyme disease, which almost all of us know someone who has it or has had it. So registration for this event will be posted shortly. Um, thank everybody for joining us and stay off those phones. Okay, thank you.